Good morning, and welcome to online worship here with Calvary Lutheran Church in Morganton, North Carolina. It is my pleasure to invite those of you who are joining us from the NC Lutheran Facebook page. We are being highlighted, Calvary Lutheran is being highlighted by uh, North Carolina Synod today, and it's a great joy and pleasure to have you all here with us. Uh, there's a number of other things uh, of worshiping with the greater church happening today. Uh, Pastor Lauren is with Grace Episcopal, which is right down the road from us. She is uh, helping out Father Marshall jo Jolly and, uh, lead in, and presiding over that service as well. So it's, uh, it's great to be here this, um, this Sunday morning, the second Sunday after, uh, of Lent. And uh, if you would like to follow along with our service, you can find the link for our bulletin. It's a Google Doc. Uh, you can find that on our website, clcmorganton.org, or you can find it in the description of this uh, Facebook Live uh, streaming service. If you haven't had a chance yet, I invite you, um, as members of Calvary Lutheran, to come to the uh, Fellowship Hall and pick up your lint in a bag for Wednesday night services. Uh, we are going to be in our second week this coming Wednesday, and we will again stream, or not stream, but uh, share that video premiering on YouTube at 6 p.m. on Wednesday night. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship by listening to the prelude. Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven. And God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. 
O God. By the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. I brought with me today, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is a crocheting hook my grandmother gave me. It was a gift to me, free, didn't have to do anything for it, freely given to me, and I can do anything with it that I want. I could put it on my shelf and forget about it and never pull it out again. I could use it to crochet some hats and scarves or blankets for other people. It is my gift, and I can do with it whatever I want. It's kind of like in our story today. We find out that Jesus gave to us the gift of love. When he died on the cross, that was a gift to us. Nobody can take that away from us. It is a gift freely given, and we can do with that love whatever we want. We can put it away and never think about it again and just know that God gave us love through Jesus. Or we could use Jesus' love to give to others, to remind them of his love. It is your choice. Nobody can take it away from you, no matter what. But using that gift of love to show others his love is really what Jesus wants us to do. By doing things like um, helping mom or dad around the house, giving hugs to people, blowing kisses when you can't actually be close to them, sending cards, ca calling or texting, just letting someone know that you love them. Those are great ways to share in Jesus' love. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for the gift of love that you gave to each of us freely without anything that we had to do. Just knowing that you love us helps us each and every day. We ask all this in your name, Lord. Amen. First reading comes from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you. The kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offsprings after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offsprings after you. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be your name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her and I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Holy 
The second reading comes from Romans chapter 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he be believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trans trespasses and was raised for our justification. Return to the Lord your God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For, that, what, for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Whenever someone changes their name, you know there is something very important going on. And you can usually assume it has something to do with a relationship as well. Marriage is the most common cause for a name change today. But sometimes people find other reasons. Sometimes the change of a name is even done for them. At an adoption, perhaps. Or imposed on them from the outside, like my name was when I became ordained. I've shared this story a few times before, but growing up, I was always known as PJ. And then when my bishop uh, uh, was to ordain me, she said to me, you will not be Pastor PJ, you will be Pastor Paul. And my name changed because my relationship with the church was changing as well. For longer than most people live, Abraham and Sarah had gone by different names. But when God came to them and made a covenant with them, promising them new life at a time when only death was, seemed possible, everything changed, starting with their names. When promises are made to one another, 
identities change, including, believe it or not, God's. From this point on, throughout the rest of Scripture, Abraham is known as Abraham. Sarai is known as Sarah. And God is known as the God of Abraham. As I would have mentioned last week, if I hadn't completely changed my sermon altogether, covenants reveal to us the character of God. Throughout this season of Lent, the first reading will all be about covenants. Last week, it was about the covenant God made with Noah. And this week, it's about the covenant God makes with Abraham and Sarah. Covenants also bind one to another. And time and time again, we see God reaching out to God's creation, risking change, and binding God's own self to God's own creation. From Noah to Abraham and finally to the cross, God promises us that there is nothing that can separate us from God's binding yet ultimately freeing love. The reality of such covenants have continued into today as well. I think back on the history of this congregation of Calvary Lutheran in Morganton, North Carolina, and the promises of God that were believed in that have brought us to where we are today. A church that continues to reach out over and over again to adapt to the changing world around it. Creating new relationships with an ever-changing community and binding itself to others with the freedom of God's love. A congregation that has committed itself to love one another as God has loved them. The Apostle Paul describes such commitment, such belief in God's promises as hoping against hope. Hoping against hope, Abraham believed what God promised him, that he would become the father of many nations. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which many would have thought was already as good as dead, for he was uh, about a hundred years old at the time, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Hoping against hope at age 100, Abraham did not weaken in faith, but grew stronger, giving even more glory to God as he faithfully followed the promise. Some people may see an organization like the church over 2,000 years old, as nearly dead and irrelevant. But the church continues to over and over again spring up anew, strengthened by the faith of those believing in God's promise. People will say that ministry of God cannot be done, not here, not in us, not now. It's too late, not in the midst of a pandemic. But God has promised, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and God's promises are true. In Christ, it is never too late to believe in God's promise. Through the cross, God's covenant of new life with us is everlasting, always new, always present, and always committed, no matter what the age we might be living in. It may look strange. It may look completely different than we expected. It may even give cause for a new name, a change of identity altogether, but the will of God will be done throughout Christ's body. Again, it's always worth repeating, God has promised to do so, and God's promises are true. In this church, I have been blessed to know so many inspiring models of faithfulness. You are all powerful witnesses to the eternal promise God has made to God's people through Jesus. And you continue to show me every day, especially during this pandemic, even online, that you cannot limit God. Because as soon as you say, that's it, this or that is dead, there's no way the church can continue in an online format only. God must be done here. God goes and makes something new, opens our hearts and minds to something new altogether. Don't limit God. 
It's not like you can anyway. When it comes to God's love for you, God has no limits. Jesus proved that on the cross. When we try to limit what God can do, to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, that's it, enough. After this point, surely God will be done with us. All we are really doing is revealing our own limitations on the love that is given to us freely and our own inabilities to be true to the promises we make when we first fell in love. This, I believe, is what Peter was doing when he took Jesus aside in our gospel for today and rebuked him for talking about all the suffering and rejection he was about to go through. It didn't match up with Peter's expectations. He was trying to limit God's love. He was ashamed by it and did not think it was powerful enough to withstand such suffering and rejection. Peter felt like most of the world still feels today that power is best demonstrated through wealth, might, and fame by climbing a ladder and putting the weak underneath you. Jesus was showing that power is made perfect in weakness. God is not like the world. And with God in Christ Jesus, love is revealed to be more powerful than all, even a shameful death on a cross. Here, especially during the season of Lent, we confess our shame that moves us into so many isolating places in our lives. We become so shameful for not believing in the promise that we fail to just open our eyes and see that God is still there, promising to us a new life. And we leave it at the cross, all of our shame. Then, as we receive God's promise of forgiveness and journey out from the cross, we confess our faith, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. Hear the witness of of the faithful in your lives. Even those who are maybe not as confident as Abraham or the Apostle Paul, and perhaps more like Peter. Hear the promises of God. Through those promises, God has bound God's self to you forever. Do not be ashamed. Be affirmed. Believe Jesus loves you. Believe and be made new. Hear the voice of God at the baptism of our Lord, just before he was driven out into the wilderness. This is my son, with whom I am well pleased. Through Christ, we share in that same baptism. We share in that same pleasure to be called children of God. In the grace and love of God, you will hear Christ say unto you, You are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Amen.